Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, sorry. Uh, Lisa, I just want to say I love the fact that even your architecture diagram for the system on which you're running ontologies looks like an ontology diagram. That's, it's turtles all the way down even in your slides. That was a great presentation. Um, before I get started today on uh, big data, I want to point something out. Uh, I am in a room full of semantic idealists. Um, there is another world out there, uh, which is the uh, neck beard wearing scruffy nerf herder, it'll never work, we can't classify the world, let's let the machines do it world. Uh, I've referred to this in the past as big data's odd couple. Um, one side of the world thinks that if you could just taxonomize and get everyone to tag everything properly with 17 attributes that are all properly linked, the universe would reveal itself and we'd never lose content. The other side is rather like uh, Jeff Goldblum in the uh, Jurassic Park movie, uh, of which uh, his boss says he has a deplorable excess of personality. Uh, he's a nihilist who believes in chaos theory and wants to turn things over to nature. Um, and it's kind of like these two guys, right? One wears a suit and wants everything organized, the other's kind of scruffy. And you certainly see this when you, you saw the early versions of like Yahoo's taxonomy and the later versions of Google's page rank algorithm. Google is perpetually guessing at what the right answer is, but those guesses are frighteningly good. And as I'm going to talk about today, we sometimes mistake them for fact. But I do want to call out that in a room full of people whose job it is to fix the mess left by those scruffy neckbeards um, and try and clean up and organize and taxonomize the world, I am coming to you from a decidedly scruffy perspective. I work on big data. Uh, I work in a world where uh, people prefer algorithms and correlation over causality and curation. And so I apologize if I sound like I'm uh, preaching to the wrong choir here. Uh, I recognize, and I just added this slide while I was sitting there, um, that there are two worldviews here and they are competing and neither one is completely right, uh, but that that tension does exist. So I'm probably gonna talk to you from the other side of that a little bit more, uh, but it's worth saying. Um, I do a lot of speaking on uh, subjects like big data. Recently, I've become very interested in the ethical and civil rights issues surrounding big data, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about those today. And then if we have time, I'll take some questions. I'm gonna touch on three different things, big data, uh, the problem with answers, and some of the civil rights issues that are going to arise from this in the future. Many of these ideas have been written about in proper words and prose on Solve for Interesting, so um, I'd love your feedback on those. If you can't f understand the slides, they're a little un unintelligible. I tend to like pictures too much, um, but the slides will be available online. Big data, as we call it, isn't really anything new. Um, I'm gonna give you a duck definition of big data as in if it quacks like a duck and it smells like a duck and it looks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Because the reality is that not since the term cloud computing have we had anything as nebulous, and I can make puns like nebulous in a room like this, as uh, big data, and everybody's debating what it is. So if you have a thing that looks like five or more of these, it's probably big data. Um, first of all, large amounts of information. How large? We don't know. Maybe it's more than it's easy to go through with a spreadsheet. Uh, often from public and private sources, commingled somehow. Public information on Twitter, private information about a customer or something you know about a subscriber. Often easily linked and collected. There are often unique keys that emerge. Uh, that can be someone's name, they're not perfect keys. They're uh, quasi-unique keys, but computers are pretty good at guessing this stuff. Stored just because we can. The cost of storage is vanishingly small, and so we often just throw things on hard drives and assume that smarter machines will kick the can, we can kick the can forward and smarter machines will analyze it. It's sort of like freezing yourself today in the hopes that when they defrost you, they'll have cured whatever ails you. Only here we just store it today in the hopes that by the time we take it away, we, we analyze it, we'll have machines smart, smart enough to figure out that context. And there's actually a pretty good argument that happens. I mean, if you look at IBM's Watson, it's really good at figuring things out, even though it's doing so probabilistically. So in the same way that we might freeze ourselves and hope for resuscitation and cure later, many times we're just storing this data because we think the algorithms and computers of tomorrow will be smart enough to draw their own ontological inferences and make their own decisions. That analysis often happens through a combination of humans and machines. So it's not just that a computer is crunching this, but that it's visualizing things in ways humans can explore so our pattern matching brains can complement the computer's ability to parse large amounts of information. And it's often done in near real time. This is in sharp contrast to data analysis of the last few uh, decades, where you had the business intelligence group that would mine things and deliver a quarterly report. Today we're tapping on things on our iPad and trying to understand data. More and more often this stuff is applied to business, which means it's not just um, being used in academia, but it's someone who was using a spreadsheet and now they're using some other interface to look at data. 
Um, so there's a much broader, more democratized view of this stuff. And finally, whatever's happening is fed back into the system. So uh, in many cases, when you've got a lot of data and you're mining through it, what you found useful changes the filters for what the system is going to define as useful later on. Now, like I said, I can't tell you what big data is, but if it's got five or more of these things, it's probably big data-ish. And we're getting better at defining big data. What I can tell you is a universal truth of storage and data that's changing. Um, if you look at this model here, in the past, you had traditionally been able to grab two of these three things for a reasonable price. You could have a large amount of information that's all the same, like all structured the same, and you could get answers very quickly. You could have a large amount of information that's varied, but it took a long time to get those answers. Or you could have a small amount of information that was varied and get answers quickly. But you couldn't get all three because the cost of doing all three was prohibitively high. And this is the closest I can come to a useful technical definition. Uh, these three Vs of volume, velocity, and variety are the hallmarks of any data storage and retrieval system. When you're trying to pull data off something, if you want something that's all three of these, it's going to be very expensive. Google has spent billions of dollars building these information palaces next to fjords and ice flows and dams. This is not cheap to do this quickly. And even in Google's case, the information they're storing has been very sanitized by crawlers. So the traditional equation for the last 50 years that information architects have had to deal with is, which of these two do I need? If I want to get a large amount of information, I want to analyze it quickly, better all be pretty standardized. So a Dewey Decimal number, for example, or going to a more modern standard, tweets. They're very well understood. There's a few things like RT and the at sign and the hashtag. It's a fairly small message size, which means it can be incredibly optimized. Whereas if you have something that's got a lot of variety, like, say, pivot tables, lots of data in them, uh, and you want answers fairly quickly, then you probably can't use that much information and things slow down. This is the constraint under which information architects have worked for the last few decades. What's changing and what is new about big data, because there's nothing new about this, is the economic cost of getting all three is dropping amazingly fast. For decades, this has been true, that your big times your fast times your varied data equals some kind of constant. And big data is actually about that constant dropping dramatically. None of this stuff's new. It's just the cost of doing all three is descending to zero before our eyes. Now. Moore's law has made it significantly easier and cheaper to do this. You probably saw these pictures. Uh, Google just unveiled some of its massive data centers. There's a data center in uh, China run by the Chinese government that is 20 square kilometers. 20 square kilometers. It's hooked up to the Three Gorges Dam, which I had only heard about when I played Civilization as a kid. It was like one of those wonders you completed. Anybody nerdy, nerdy in the room remember that? Yeah, civilization, I learned my history there too. Um, so uh, Moore's Law has made it significantly cheaper and easier to do this stuff because big, fast, and varied got cheap. Every time we do a Google search, we're using big data. And when things get cheap and abundant, a funny thing tends to happen. Anybody here know what this is? Usually nobody knows these things, but I'm in a room full of people who spend their life knowing these things. This is Newcomen's Atmospheric Engine. In 1712, at the start of the industrial era, there was a problem because the industrial era was fueled by coal and coal mines tended to get flooded and there was no way to empty them. And this guy, Newcomen, came up with an atmospheric engine that could pump coal out of the ground, uh, sorry, water out of the ground so you could get into the coal mines. And of course, it was fueled by coal. So the more you got out of the ground, the more you threw coal in the machine, the more water you sucked out, the more you could get out of the ground. And the industrial revolution was off to a start. It wasn't very efficient. And this should just go to show you that inventing something is not as cool as perfecting it. Uh, that's why we all remember Steve Jobs. Uh, it's also, uh, there were MP3 players before the iPod, remember? Uh, it's also why James Watt is the name we use to describe a unit of power. Uh, between 1763 and 1775, James Watt dramatically improved on Newcomen's original design with Watt's steam engine, which used 75% less coal than its predecessor. It was four times as efficient. Four times better, that's pretty awesome. Which led this guy, William Stanley Jevons, to ask what the hell was going on. Those weren't his exact words. <laughs> because he said, look, when something becomes more efficient, shouldn't we consume less of it? I mean, if I've got a car that's more efficient, shouldn't I be able to drive further and use less gas? But what happened was the reverse. The more efficient we got at burning coal, 
the sh more the coal shortage got worse. And there's a reason for this. It's called Jevons paradox because it recognizes that as something becomes efficient, it can sometimes increase consumption. Efficiency means lower costs. Lower costs means new uses. New uses means more demand, and more demand means more consumption. And this is known as Jevons paradox. So the thing I want you to take away from today's presentation, if you remember only one thing, is that big data is about abundance. As the drop of as those three factors, as that trifecta has dropped to zero, the number of ways we can use information of huge quantities with huge variety very, very quickly is exploding. And we live in a world of abundant, instant, ubiquitous information. And what I want to spend the rest of today talking about is how that's changing us. Because big data is fundamentally about an abundance of access to cheap analysis of data in real time. Any questions or comments? Anybody want to throw anything at me yet? Let's try and change that. The problem with answers. I want to talk about a consequence of having all of that data lying around. <clears throat> We're humans. We're stupid. We are running on jungle surplus hardware. Um, we are mostly good at making decisions based on trust, based on influence. We as sp a species don't try, we didn't evolve to try and find the truth. We evolved to try and get the approval of our peers because that kept us within our society, it kept us fed and sheltered, it kept us protected. There is very good evidence, and I'll refer you to a book called The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt that goes into this in great detail, it's a fantastic read. Um, there is very good evidence that human groups evolved to sort of punish those that didn't cooperate and getting approval within that group was essential to our survival as a species and also within our tribes. Now there are some constraints of human biology. Uh, one of them is something called the Dunbar limit. Our biological brains are wired with the number of social relationships we can track and it's more than any other primate. We're pretty good at it, but it's still around 150. It's lower in high primates and so on and so on. And for millennia, this is the number of people we could keep track of the Dunbar limit. Some people are a little higher, some are a little lower, but for most of us, there's about 150 relationships we can keep track of. And by keep track of, I mean I can keep track of about 150 people and know how they're related to the other 149. So I can find a person in my head and say, that person, I know who else in the 150 I can track. It doesn't scale much beyond that. As you add more people, scale goes up exponentially. Actually, it goes up factorially if you're really paying attention. Um, so we, the problem with this is that we like 150 things and we look for confirmation of our beliefs rather than understanding. Whether you think you're clever or not, everyone looks for this confirmation. In fact, uh, plenty of studies show that the folks in this room, uh, by the way, did you know psychologists call you weird? Anybody know what weird stands for? It's a common psychological term. Western, educated, independent, rich Democrats. And the preponderance of psychological studies done by universities on their fellow grads, guess who they're surveying? Western, educated, independent, rich Democrats. In Jonathan Haidt's book, he goes down the street three miles to a McDonald's, and he gets entirely different surveys, responses from the families that are there. Now, I'm going to spare you some of the dirty, messy surveys, but I'll give you one example. And this is going to be a little off-color, so I apologize. Uh, I've done many of these. Some of them are really off-color, but I'll just give you one here, and I won't even use pictures. Um, imagine that a man goes to a grocery store on a Friday afternoon. He purchases a chicken to roast for dinner from the store. Perfectly normal chicken, skin, no neck, ready to go. He goes home, he turns on the stove, but before he cooks the chicken, he has sex with it. How many people here think that's morally wrong? <laughs> Hands up if you think it's morally wrong. So first thing is, if I gave you two minutes to think about it, fewer of you would think it was morally wrong. Because your immediate visceral reaction, and, and in the slide, which I didn't put up, you can imagine the picture. <laughs> you want to see the slide? I can show you the slide. I have a slide. You don't want to, no, you want to see the slide? <laughs> He's just stuffing the chicken. It's all. No, really? Come on. It's Friday afternoon. I have to wake people up. So the point here is that that is a dumbfounding answer. Your moral brain goes, that's repulsive. Your rational brain goes, that's OK. And the answers from the people at McDonald's would be, oh, well, maybe he gets salmonella poisoning. Like, they'd come up with these rationalizations after the fact for why this was morally wrong. And he'd give them these challenging questions that seem viscerally strange. And if you are a Western, educated, independent, 
rich Democrat, you start to rationalize and you say, yeah, as long as it's fair and no one's being hurt, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> That's just what we do. It's a great book, <laughs> despite the rather troubling subject matter. Um, so one look at Google shows that this is true, right? We spend a lot of time looking up subjects we'd like to know a lot about, but many people spend a lot of time on Google looking for proof and confirmation of their beliefs, um, whether you're talking about global warming or evolution, which is why a page on the dangers of vaccines has thousands of fans and huge amounts of traffic despite the fact that it's one of the greatest advances in human science. Because if more than 150 people support you, then obviously you're in the majority, at least according to your Dunbar limit. And this is one of the problems with big data, is that we search for the answer instead of searching for the question. So I did a little bit of research on this. Um, I went to look for proof that evolution was fake and then proof that evolution was real. And I thought, what the hell, let's score this. Well, it turns out a preponderance of web results favor evolution. And this right here is the problem with a calculated big data probabilistic web as opposed to a semantic structured curated web is that it all comes down to a vote on who's less stupid. Obama is a Muslim, Obama is a Christian. Turns out 63% think he's a Christian. I could go on all day, so I will. Vaccines are dangerous, vaccines are safe. Turns out about 63% there, probably the same people who think Obama's a Muslim. I can say that, I'm not voting. Um, video games are violent, or video games make you smarter. Well, it looks like video games make you violent. I don't remember that Atari 2600 making me want to kill things, but maybe if they look like big square blocks. Um, <laughs> Obama was born in Kenya or Obama was born in America, it turns out they've mostly decided he's born in the US. Egg yolks are bad for you, egg yolks are good for you. Yeah, we're split on that one. <laughs> moon landing real, moon landing fake. Well, it turns out the moon landing is pretty much uh, real, but most of the results that said it were fake were making fun of people who think it's fake. Uh, how about climate change, real, fake? Well, we've pretty much made up our mind and there's some compelling photographic evidence to support that. Finding answers that confirm what we already believe dramatically increases polarization. There's a recent Pew study of the election and the electoral positions in the US, and the Pew or, uh, Research Group found that Republicans and Democrats in the US have never been this far apart. If you try and analyze people's positions on a bunch of social and fiscal issues, and you segment them by different groups, you will find that whether you segment by race, by education, by income, by religion, or by gender, None of those segments explain things as much as political affiliation. Men and women agree on more issues than Republicans and Democrats. Rich and poor agree on more issues than Republicans and Democrats. Educated and uneducated. Muslims and Christians agree on more issues than Republican and Democrat. If you look at all this data on things like the responsibility of government to do things, or whether you have old-fashioned values, or whether something's run by the government, you see this incredible polarization that's happening across all these organizations. Really, really frightening. Here's a good example from a recent announcement by the federal government. The White House announced a program to have innovators build tools to open up government and make administration more transparent. You think this was good for both sides, right? The Democrats say, hey, this is fair, it's open. And the Republicans say, great, now we can find out why they're lying to us. I may be wearing my political leanings on my sleeve today. Um, but if you analyze this stuff, you'll see three very clear-cut groups. Over on the left is the federal government and its friends. In the middle is the sort of techno-pundits like Alex Howard from O'Reilly Media. And over on the right is Fox News. And if you look at the tag clouds, right, the Obama administration is saying things like innovate and biopharma and energy and open government. The tech wonks are saying things like change the ratio. Some of them said things like Borg. And um, the conservative pundits are saying things like don't liberate my data. I thought these guys were libertarians. Um, liberal translated, Alice in Obama land, uh, war on women, free market, Gov 2.0, and liberals translated. I love that there's a rising hashtag from conservatives called war on women. That's just awesome. Um, Turns out that um, there's a huge polarization because both of these groups are seeing what they want to see. And there are some ways we could try and tackle this problem because it is a problem that is a result of this rising tide of big data where once upon a time an industry analyst with expensive business intelligence platforms could analyze data. Now anybody with a search bar can do so and think they're being clever. As we've seen, looking at Google search results is one possibility. If you type in something like is evolution, you can see um, what the leading queries are, that'll give you a hint. 
Uh, and I actually went through and scored all this stuff and said, I wonder if there's a way we could use Google to score these things. The problem with that, obviously, is that the data set is not accurate. Google's just guessing what's relevant. And in some cases, vaccines are safe produces the safe vaccine lie as a relevant hit. Um, you can also try and analyze things across countries. Um, this is Canada versus America. It turns out 2% more of us think evolution is real up here than in the US. Um, the second method is you can ask a non-leading question. It's very hard to get people to do this. Uh, what usually happens when you do that is you get sent to Wikipedia, where people talk about subjects in some degree of uh, accuracy, and there's a, a vetting process and curation and so on. Uh, so you can look at method three, the rate of change of articles, and see how volatile something is, because frequent edits might suggest an area of controversy. I didn't feel like parsing all of the content on Wikipedia for the subjects I looked at, and I'm incredibly lazy, so I called up a guy named Diedrich Van Leary, who lives in Toronto, and asked him to do it. Now, the good news is he works for Wikimedia, and he has access to a lot of tools. So he did these queries for me, and he stuck them in uh, Google Fusion Tables, which is an amazing tool for doing data analysis over large amounts of information. It turns out that the number of edits about Barack Obama's page go up to around 280 a day on certain times, especially when he's running for office. Uh, vaccination edits go up quite a lot. Um, I'd love to know what happened about vaccination on October 28th, because there were something like 18 edits. So you can sort of do this evolution, you know, evolution, something happened. I have no idea what all of a sudden they just sort of shut the page down or somebody who was really angry died, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> evolution edits, this page gets edited about 180 times a day. That's a lot of controversy. And you can go see those edits and find out just how crazy they are and so many of them are things being set back. You can look at climate change. In fact, Wikipedia is a great source of information. Before Romney announced his running mate, we could pretty much tell who was going to win. Because guess what? Their pages were getting edited a lot. So guess whose page was being updated the most? Paul Ryan's. Guess who he chose? Paul Ryan. So there's a whole cleanup act happening to get that ready for the scrutiny that's coming. Um, you can also see who the world thought was going to win. This is uh, Marco Rubio's page, clearly the guy that everybody uh, was, was visiting the most. And then the people that were stalking it, so uh, Bobby Jindal had a lot of people following his page. Um, because obviously insiders thought something was going on. That's a pretty good case of the actual edits giving us strong signal. And now there's still problems with this because you have things like Conservapedia, which runs articles like how did the elements come to existence? Is the Bible correct? And there are other tools for looking at this stuff. In many cases, the commentary in the background tells us a lot. So for example, I can go on uh, Reddit where that egg yolk article happened. Um, and I can say, look, go and read the stupid comments because oftentimes the internet has a way of outing the dumb people. And Tools like Reddit float things up to the top. And now I apologize, but it's a Friday afternoon. You're all drinking afterwards, right? So I'm going to show a picture that may make some of you laugh. Um, here's another example. If you didn't notice, here's where you should be looking. Um, so uh, one US rower was particularly excited by his bronze medal, says Reddit. Um, the best part about this is that guy's a Redditor. So he says, this is me, and I swear I'm not erect. <laughs> Sarah told me you guys needed to laugh a little this afternoon. so. Uh, lawsuits will be in the hall afterwards. Um, and uh, here's the guy taking a picture of himself with his photo and his girlfriend from the neck up, I'll point out. Um, and so this is a very interesting example of how the internet flattens things so you can verify content very quickly, whether we believe him or not. Um, method five, you can search for a subject and then you can show related content. So in this case, uh, a Google search, Google puts this stuff on the side for certain controversial pages and says, here are people related to this topic which is kind of cool, there's a little bit of curation there, these are people that have come up, right? And we have a way to fix some of these problems. I mean, we obviously can determine the thousand most controversial topics in the world. There aren't that many at any given time, they're the ones that have high variance of editing, high polarization of search results. We could detect when someone is searching for an answer instead of asking a question and help them phrase it as a question. And then we could show them some kind of tiebreaker. So here's what that might look like. If you and, and by the way, I think this would be a really cool plugin to build. I'm actually going to see if I can get it coded. Um, the problem is only the people who already are skeptical will install a plugin, so it defeats its whole purpose. Um, the key here is to make Fox News's browser um, install this feature. So um, you could say, hey, by the way, the topic you're searching for is controversial. Um, here's some suggestions. You could read some background information on it, whatever. Look at these five studies. Um, you could put a sidebar in there that says scientific consensus based on that thing across these studies. You could say economic consensus on social medicine across these things. Uh, here's what Snopes or PolitiFact says about it. And here's some experts to follow. That'd be pretty cool. And I do think that as we move towards a world where the scruffy neckbeard chaotic sort of uh, data nihilists 
want machines to analyze everything, we're going to need to supplement that with some amount of curation, either machine or human-based, for controversial topics like this, just to surface the fact that noise is not always signal. I love this quote by Max Born. Um, he believed that, if the, that the idea that there was only one truth in the world and that one was in sole possession of it is the root of most evil in the world, and I tend to agree with him. Um, I do think that there are a number of uh, different options for this, and I, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, another proposal, which is a more general one, which is to adopt a PO mindset. Because abundant data changes how we live, how we love, how we work, and how we play, um, but we have to change how we govern society in a data-driven world. So I'm going to talk about what I mean by a PO mindset in a minute, but first I want to talk a little bit about civil rights. Now this is a pretty controversial topic. The problem is that big data is really good at predicting things. And prediction is very close to prejudice. Big data is great because it helps us ward off disease. Searches for the word flu can help you predict an epidemic. It helps us pinpoint disasters and earthquakes and get in touch with victims. Reveals corruption, makes cities smarter, improves the way we teach. New York City's School of One in about three hours a day can take a failing in, um, urban school, school student from a poor area of New York City and make them perform at the top of their class simply by analyzing how well they learn and changing how you teach them for three hours a week. On the other hand, big data might erode our privacy. It might make us slaves to the analytics that we rely on. Uh, it can justify our prejudices, if we, as we've just seen. It can polarize groups, and it can reveal embarrassing truths about ourselves. Let me give you a concrete example. Anybody here use OkCupid? Okay Nobody wants to admit to using OPQ. <laughs> Nothing wrong with online dating. Come on. So OKCupid's a dating site. And one of the things that you do on a dating site is you tell people about yourself. And usually that information includes your race and your gender and your preferences, which is great fodder for analysts. So if you go through all those profiles and you find out words that stand out, let's say, for white males that don't stand out for other races or genders, you've got a pretty good idea of words that white men like. <laughs> Guess what? Prejudices often start from truths. Um, white women. Admittedly, this is a bit old, or Christian Grey would be right up there at the top. This is great. Librarians don't read Fifty Shades of Grey. I thought that, 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 that joke kills in the States. <coughs> Admittedly, this is, okay, what? I can do Wuthering Heights, maybe? I got prejudices, see? Um, we could analyze this by job and find out what, what, what librarians really did like. So um, I'm going to do audience participation time, right? Um, first thing I want to ask you guys, uh, show of hands if the, uh, sorry, hang on one second. I think my slides just jumped around there. Sorry about that. I lost all my flow, didn't I? Here we go. OK, audience participation time. Anybody want to volunteer? Um, what, we know what gender it is from the picture. Anybody want to volunteer what race this is? Awkward, isn't it? <laughs> it's not Jewish. <clears throat> Black men, how about this one? La Latin women, correct. <laughs> Gangnam style should be up there, but it's not. Um, this is a couple of years old, so uh, Asian men. Um, and Indian women. It's really amusing, but it's also really uncomfortable because we all know what that was, but there's something weird about knowing it, right? Um, so when bank managers tried to restrict the loans of certain residents in certain areas, which was a practice known as redlining, Congress stepped in. This is an actual drawing from a bank manager's wall where he'd drawn the borders of geographic areas and was refusing loans to anybody who lived in those areas because they were predominantly black neighborhoods. The US government passed the Fair Housing Act in 1968 and legislated against discrimination, making it illegal to base your loan policy on someone's race. But I can base it on whether you like the Big Lebowski. I wrote about this a little while ago, and Anders Sandberg, who works uh, for the Practical Ethics Department at Oxford, made this comment far more articulately than I could. Nobody notices the offers they don't get. In a world where we can analyze and break things down to the individual level like that, personalization looks a lot like prejudice. And this is why I think that many of the big data issues that I've talked about here start to look like civil rights issues very, very quickly if we're not careful. 
Abundant data changes how we live, how we love, how we work, and how we play. It's going to change the kind of person that makes decisions in business. I mean, Don Draper was a great example of the old model of doing business. He convinced people to act in the absence of information. He was compelling. He was an expert. They trusted his pattern recognition and his ability to act as a proxy for a market. Just like representative government, experts are a hack for a world where it's really hard to get the actual information. So we elect representatives to speak on our behalf, or we appoint a leader who seems convincing or seems compelling or understands the market. But in a digital world, we don't really care what this guy thinks anymore. Anybody here seen Moneyball? That's what we care about, right? What's happening in the boardrooms of North America is the firing of those talent scouts who say, ah, oh, he's a good pitcher because his girlfriend's attractive, because that's a pattern this person seems to have cooked up, and replacing them with some nerdy like spreadsheets, but can give them evidence of on-bat time. So we are increasingly moving away from a culture of conviction to a culture of evidence, hopefully. Now, this is a really weird way to look at the world, and it's going to require that we think differently. This is a guy named Edward de Bono. Anybody know Edward de Bono? Lateral thinking. Brilliant author, kind of prolific. Um, and he said there are actually three answers to the world. He said, look, there's yes and there's no. And then there's this third world, this third answer called Poe which he says stands for possibly. So in his world, no means science. Show me the data, prove it's true, and so on. Yes means faith. Prove I'm wrong. The onus is on you to disprove me. Let me review that. No is skepticism. No is prove it to me science that says it's not true unless you can demonstrate that it is true. Science is hard pressed to make leaps of faith and have inspiration and take a, take a a jump at first blush because it demands causality. On the other hand, yes, which is I don't need evidence, assumes everything is true unless disproven. It infers correlation from coincidence. But it's very hard to make objective decisions based on subjective belief. Many scientists are quick to dismiss faith, dismiss faith pardon me, but leaps of faith and spontaneous insights give us many of the things we take for granted. So there's this new third way that de Bono talks about called Poe. It's possibility, it's the creative process. It says, what if this is the case without assuming it was so? Poe is what Rene Descartes called withholding assent. It means don't eliminate something yet, just now, so that speculation can continue unabated. This is how brainstorming works. Now, there's no genius without a mixture of madness, as the saying goes. Um, Dali said it best. There's only one difference between a madman and me. I am not mad. However, recent researches into psychology and brain chemistry behind creativity show that what we think of as geniuses do things along two dimensions. They do things along both intellect, meaning raw reasoning power, and openness, meaning the willingness to accept new ideas. Intellect is brainy. It's what we think of logic and reason and deduction. It's skeptical thinking. It's the need to prove things. On the other hand, creativity is what we think of as zany, leaps of insight, perceiving patterns where they may not exist, induction. So if we put these on a grid, because I like to group my friends and then figure out who I should spend time with, on the one dimension, you have intellect, all the reasoning and stuff, right? Little intellect, you're pretty dim-witted. Lots of intellect, you're brainy. On the other dimension, we have creativity. A Little bit of creativity, you're very strict. You don't take ideas. You don't take leaps of faith. You're very organized. A lot of creativity, you're kind of zany and wacky. I don't really want to spend time with the people in this corner. Sorry, life's too short. If you're in the bottom right corner, then you're a fundamentalist. You say yes. You see patterns everywhere. You believe in what Stephen Colbert calls truthiness. You make mistake coincidence for correlation. You look, look at what the consensus is. You're very subjective. You tend to be irrational. But being up in the top left corner is just as bad, with apologies to a bunch of people who spend their time in books. Saying no and being unwilling to speculate is also a bad thing. You can't find analogies. You don't have empathy for groups. What the world needs more of is this Poe mentality. Genius says possibly. It finds patterns, and then it uses strict authoritative correlation to verify those patterns. It's open to changes, but demands testing. If you're down in the fundamentalist side, you probably should ask questions like, can you prove this belief? What is causing it? How could someone else independent of me verify it? What are the rules of this system? Whereas if you're over on the bookworm, lots of brainy little creativity side, you probably want to say things like, consider the possibility that. What else could this mean? How could others perceive it? What does this remind you of? Because tomorrow's thinkers are really up in the top right corner. They're talking about possibilities. So I want to close with four big concerns about big data. First of all, uh, while 
leakiness and online promiscuity is not necessarily a problem. Our online lives are very promiscuous. Every click, every like, every tweet is a digital breadcrumb. We've gone from don't put your location on the web, because that would be unsafe 10 years ago, to hey, check in whenever you're not at home and tell everyone in a few short years. That's not very good. We give up our privacy in return for access to free services, but increasingly, even the services we pay for, like Verizon, are selling our privacy down the road for paid services. Remember, aggregate is just another word for stereotype. So when they're selling aggregated data, they're still forming stereotypes about you. Show of hands, if the first thing you looked at this morning was your mobile device. Hands up high. Come on, keep them up. OK, including spouses or significant others or partners. <laughs> Show of hands, first thing you looked at was a mobile device. All right, next one. Sarah looked at two. Next one. Um, how many of you have tweeted, liked, checked in something from a toilet in the last 24 hours? <laughs> the rest of you are lying. <laughs> or there's really bad signal. We are developing prosthetic brains. And the problem with those prosthetic brains is that they are, uh, we're going from a society that lives in one world to a society that lives in two and growing prosthetic brains to accommodate that. The second concern from big data is the vanishing cost of finding things out. Once, unless you were under investigation, it was really hard to collect data from everywhere. But big data tools are great at reassembling things, baking the breadcrumbs of our digital life back into a loaf. In one click on Peak U, I found this out about me yesterday night. Um, this is everything, including background checks, where I've lived. Uh, it's pretty creepy. Free, by the way, one click. The third problem, correlation is not causality. Big data is so good at making predictions that they look like fact. There's an old story about ice cream and drowning. Ice cream is very strongly correlated with drowning. Everybody know this? It's true. Ice cream, is very, ice cream consumption is very strongly correlated with drowning. But nobody says we should ban ice cream to save drowning victims because that would be dumb. What we should understand is that they're both correlated with summertime. We eat more ice cream in the summer, we drown in the summer. Big data encourages us to make predictions that aren't optimal because it makes convincing guesses. IBM's Watson or Google are simply guessing what's best. They don't actually know, often frighteningly well. And fourth, big data involves machines that aren't flexible. Uh, a couple of years ago, I talked to a European diplomat who should remain nameless about uh, the European Union and in particular France's approach to data. He said, do you know why the French hate traffic cameras? I said, why? He said, because it makes it really hard for them to cheat on their spouses. He contended that while it was possible for a couple to overlook a brush of lipstick on a collar, a stray hair or whatever, hard proof of a speeding ticket from somewhere you said you weren't can't be ignored. So I really think that the ethical issues around big data have to do with mistaking predictions for fact have to do with assembling the breadcrumbs of our digital lives that we thought hadn't outed us into a well-baked loaf of embarrassment, and the lack of ambiguity that digital systems give us, such as a digital traffic camera, where they can't show discretion and allow us to live lives in the gray areas that we've always lived. As humans went from societies that were individuals to societies that were small groups, we created laws and moral codes in order to live together. And now that we're becoming this hybrid species with one foot in the real world and one foot in the digital world, we need to create new laws and new norms and new conventions in order to live in both worlds concurrently and harmoniously. That's it from me with five minutes to spare. If you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. If not, I'd love to hear about them online. Feel free to yell at me on Twitter or elsewhere. And uh, yeah, I get five minutes, so. Okay, first I should say I love your talk. Um, I live in the US now and I wish that we could like put you in charge of the government's data stuff. But I guess the question I have is, I'm wondering if you maybe thought about while you're giving this talk that I think a lot of the librarians I know, maybe not the ones in this room, would have put programmer where you put bookworm. And that's interesting to me in terms of prejudices. It's interesting because when I present this to programmers, I say bookworm. But you're right in here, I would think programmers. It's, and, and I know a lot of creative programmers. Um, I actually think of the, my stereotype in my own head is a guy with a pocket protector and very short sleeves that works for IBM. Like that's the stereotype I have. And I know a lot of people who can't deal with ambiguity in the world and the way they deal with it is they are convinced that if they could just come up with the structure of the world down to like the perfect ontology of how society works, then their life would be great. They'd have friends and, and all that stuff. So, and I guess the further question is for those of us who are totally finding confirmation in your talk, what do you need to try and keep yourself open to other ways of seeing this? Uh, I spend a lot of, it's funny, I, I actually talked to Rick Smolin, who's the guy that does the Day in the Life books, and he's doing one called the Day in the Life of Big Data, 
Um, he's presenting at the uh, Ford Foundation's, uh, they have an event on Tuesday for Wired Change that I was supposed to go to, but I got to go to Strata now, which would have been great because Tim Berners-Lee was there and I could talk to Sir Tim. I love that quote about Sir Tim is watching you. Um, Rick had this list of people he was going to interview for a day in the life. And the last page was like Bono, Bob Geldof. And I said, you don't have any Republicans on that page. And it was total confirmation bias. He hadn't even thought that he should maybe, you know, go down the street to McDonald's. I think calling out that stuff about, like, we're all weird, and we just need to recognize that. Um, Jonathan Haidt's book is fantastic about this, because he really does, uh, he says that um, Western Democrats tend to make all their moral decisions based on two dimensions, which is fairness and freedom from harm. And there are other groups of things like tribal authority and um, uh, punishment that are actually very useful to society, because if you don't have them in a society, then you tend to have the tragedy of commons occur. I strongly urge you to go look at um, a, an 18 minute TED video that Jonathan Haidt um, gave on the difference between conservatives and Democrats. And he says, you could take the blue pill and stay in your comfortable world, or you could take, take the red pill and come with me to see how far the rabbit hole goes. And he does an amazing job of doing that. So I guess reading things like that and having friends with whom I vigorously disagree about a woman's right to choose and other things down in the States, um, that's a good way to keep my mind open. So. I, I, we, we live in a society where there's a real risk of falling into filter bubbles, and I think it's very important to be conscious of that and occasionally read Guns and Ammo magazine just to see what's happening. Yes? Yeah, I, I love your point about us moving from a, sorry, uh, from a culture of conviction to a culture of evidence. Uh, okay, yeah, the, the point about moving culture of conviction, culture of evidence, and that is, and, and you know, I see that, but it's also happening at a time when we are so aware of, of big stupid out there, and dominating political life, dominating cultural life. How do you reconcile the fact that we're getting both of these at the same time? Is it just that we didn't notice the big stupid before? Or? Uh, I think there's a huge polarization going on. I think Colbert called it best when he said truthiness, that sometimes, you know, Einstein said the world is a, a thing should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. I think some people would like them to be simpler. And uh, education is unfortunately the root of all this. There's a 20 year lag on what you educate people if you teach them things like Occam's razor and then 20 years later they become you know, rational, critical thinking people. Um, I don't have an answer. I see terrifying amounts of fundamentalism happening all over the world and uh, I think Bohr said it best that the belief that one is in sole possession of the only version of the truth is a really bad thing. I, I don't know how to reconcile it other than getting up and talking about it a lot, so. Yes. Um, one of the uh, things that struck me about the, the talk about civil rights and big data that's sort of secondary to you know, the possibility of tracking me um, is that last winter, uh, Bitch Magazine published a column about a woman who talks at women's studies, teaches women's studies classes or something like that and, and, and um, cultural studies classes and she gets you know, the people in her class who are predominantly female and she's working at um, uh, an urban university so they, they get a lot of, um, it's, it's not, you know, your white middle class kind of student population. And they get students to come up and she goes to Google um, and says, okay, search for yourself in Google, right? So you get people searching for Asian women or Latinos and they're horrified at the stuff that comes up because when you search for Asian women, right, with safe search off, it's not very nice. Theor hypothetically speaking, right? Hypothetically speaking. Well, this is what the column said. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's de I mean, it's definitely true for Asians. It's less true for Latinos, I think. But, right. you know, they're finding things that, and her reaction was, Google needs to fix this. And Google's reaction is, we're giving you the links that people are searching for and clicking on. So how do you deal with, the question is, yeah. I guess, how do we deal uh, this with is the a, this uh, social... Uh, Wait. So um, I'll, I'll keep this brief because I know these guys are looking like they're looming. Um, so I, I think that um, there is always a debate between the curator and the raw information. Uh, for decades, we have had a practice in, um, in uh, for decades, we've had a practice in telecommunications called common carrier uh, rights. So the reason that AT&T is not listed as a, um, is not charged in a civil suit for um, trafficking across state lines or child pornography even though the pictures may have gone across AT&T's network, is that it's labeled a common carrier, which means 
It's saying, I don't look at what goes on inside my packets. This is the irony of them wanting to do net neutrality, is that now you're looking at packets, you should have to give up that right. But um, there is this idea of common carriage, where there are certain things in the world, like the phone system, that are so useful, we can't ask that organization to police them, because then who watches the watchers and so on down that rabbit hole? And the debate here, I think, is between whether Google is a kind of common carriage, because it lets us peer into the brain of the human, human um, being, including the ugly limbic regions of that human being, they've given you the options of things like safe search, right, if you don't want to hear that. Um, the, it's, a, it's a very scary thought that, that you're now able to see. A, a friend of mine is an analyst for the world's biggest mobile porn site. I have a lot of interesting friends. Uh, he's actually a really nice guy, total numbers geek. My favorite quote from him is, um, anything you can't do in three clicks of your left hand is broken. That'll give you an idea of his job. And um, I told you I was going to embarrass you. So um, I think in this case, uh, you need to look at a situation like that. And he, by the way, interesting fact, the largest uh, demographic of people who watch porn on a mobile device is men in the southern US. Because those families tend to have one computer, and that man absconds to somewhere else to look at it on his little handheld device, because he doesn't want that on the family machine. Um, he said to me, we are never as honest as in our search bar. And I think the reality here is that Google is feeding off that search bar and those clicks in what we think is a very private world. So we're getting a much less filtered view of what's going on in the human brain. Uh, and I'll just give you one quick thought from Jonathan Haidt. Um, he said in the book that humans want this confirmation. And they have to learn the difference between must and can. If there's a thing that I don't want to do, I start looking for evidence that says, must I do it? Am I obliged to? And one thing that says I don't have to allows me off the hook, right? If I really want to do something, and I know I'm not supposed to, I start looking for evidence that says, can I do this thing? So we change the bias of information from must to can based on our preconceived notions. And I think being sort of self-actualized or self-aware enough to say, I'm looking at this thing from a must perspective or a can perspective, changes how we view the information we're consuming, right? Um, I think that all of these things, uh, the ability to sort of distinguish between must and can, the ability to self-filter versus, you know, to treat search as a, a raw, raw resource that's then got to be refined by whatever you want, let's say a safe uh, search engine for kids, um, we're going to quickly realize that, that the value of having raw access to the limbic region of the human brain's collective consciousness, while it's full of ugly stuff, is actually pretty useful. And it's just like when I bought my first house. My expectations for the house were up here, and the house was down here. And I gradually renovated it, and I gradually lowered my expectations. And somewhere around here, I was happy with my house. I think today, our expectations for what the internet should be like are up here, and the reality of the internet's down here. And we're going to clean it up a little bit, and we're also going to lower or adjust our expectations to this two-world human that we're going to be. And we'll probably be OK with those, but it's going to be 20 years before we're comfortable with that. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.